Thank you, Joe. Uh, good, good afternoon to all. How's everyone doing? Thank you for staying uh, on for so until the end. This is fantastic. Looking deeply within nature through the magnifying glass of science, designers are extracting principles, processes, and materials that are forming the very basis of the design methodology, translating nature out, outwardly with vector into technology. From synthetic constructs that emulate biological materials through computational methods that resemble neural processes, nature is driving design. Design is also driving nature. In the realms of genetics, regenerative medicine, and synthetic biology, designers are growing constructs not foreseen or anticipated by nature. Today I'm going to talk about the emerging field of bionics. Bionics seeks to advance electromechanical devices that attach to the body or are implanted inside the body that emulate or extend natural physiological or cognitive function. The field envisions a future where technology no longer comprises simple, lifeless tools that are not integrated with our minds and bodies. Too often today, tech produces unsophisticated technologies that really do not reflect fundamentally who we are. You know, my, my brain does not require a user manual to drive my hand. My hand is embodied in mind, and my mind embodied in hand. An integration with self without boundary or seam. The, the field of bionics envisions this embodiment between technology and humans, this integration, a future in which what is biological and what is not, what is human and what is not, what is nature and what is not, will forever be blurred. So today, to achieve this integration, this embodiment, requires the advancement of what I call extreme interfaces. And today I'll go over three extreme interfaces. One is uh, dynamic. Uh, in the case of uh, limb pathology, can we build exoskeletal or prosthetic synthetic limbs that emulate uh, normal biological limbs? The second extreme interface is electrical. Can we, can we advance neural in implants where there's a communication, electrical communication between the human body and the device and from the device back to the human body? And the final extreme interface is mechanical. How can we attach machines to the body and have that uh, physical, mechanical inter interaction healthy? So if I could have the slide. So on being bionic is the, is the topic. So I'll systematically go through these extreme interfaces and give a, uh, research examples. Then I'll finish my talk with a few uh, examples of folks that have been fitted with a bionic technology and what that technology means to them. So first, uh, extreme interface is dynamic. So years ago, working with my colleague Bob Dennis, we decided to build a swimming robot uh, uh, powered by living muscle tissue. We wanted to explore, A, um, how through electrical stimulation you can drive skeletal muscle, and secondly, um, how we can in fact achieve an organ maintenance. What can we do to keep uh, the robot alive? The best we did is the robot lasted for 48 hours before dying, uh, the muscles going to foot. Um, and in terms of controllability, we were able to vary speed and, and turning radius as well. What this taught me is that uh, this notion that uh, we see in nature of the interplay between morphology, structure, and and control. In nature, there's not a silo separating mechanical engineering, computer science, electrical engineering, and so on forth. There's an integration. When you look at the calf muscle, when you look at its structure, you can say a lot about how it's controlled. When you see how it's controlled, you can say a lot about its structure. There's a beautiful integration. So I started to think about, can we, can we control robotic appendages? And even though they're made of synthetic materials, that's nice, we don't have to deal with organ maintenance, can we control them so they move as if they were made of flesh and bone? Can we do a biophysical model-based control paradigm where we model the muscles and tendons and spinal level reflexes, and that uh, informs the controller? So to do that, we have to know something about the science of how people stand, walk, and run. 
So what you see here is pl plotted vertically as the cross correlation coefficient. This is the level biomimicity kinematically from the ankle, knee, and hip. So with a value of one, there's perfect agreement between human kinematics at those three joints and the model prediction. On the x-axis is the metabolic cost to transport. It's the amount of food energy required to transport unit weight, unit distance, a dimensionless quantity. You see on the far, far right uh, two uh, very compelling, impressive models. Uh, the first, Geyer and Herr, published in 2010, and the second, Pandy and Anderson, published in 2011. These, these muscle skeletal models do fairly well in predicting how people move, but they don't do very well in predicting how much energy people use when they walk. The shaded region is mean plus or minus standard deviation of cost of transport of human walkers. So we first asked, can we model uh, the human and do well in terms of biomimicity and energetics? And we put forth this model. So you see uh, a model structure. The lower joint is the ankle, the middle joint is the knee, and then the hip. What's interesting about this model is that all the muscles and tendons that span the knee joint are modeled as clutches in series with spring. So the idea here is under neural control, all the muscle tendons that span the knee behave as elastic structures. And in fact, what happens when you walk is there's this glorious exchange between the three mechanical energy domains, kinetic, gravitational potential energy, and the elastic form. The data uh, on the left just shows when we kinematically clamp the joints using biological data measured in a gait laboratory, can this model track um, normal knee torque versus time? The answer is yes, but what about forward dynamically? In control, we said let's build a purely reflective controller. So there's evidence that your calf muscle uh, is controlled by very dominant reflexes, where the most dominant reflex is a force feedback. When your foot's in time comes to the ground, it's a positive force feedback. The greater the force borne by the muscle tendon, the greater the neural activation on the muscle. So that's in fact what, what we do in this in this uh, representation for that modeled soleus muscle that spans the ankle. The two muscles that span the hip, we control with a PD controller to keep the upper body upright in pitch. So what emerges is a model that, that does pretty well in, in predicting how people move, uh, the torques that are required, the impedances, and how much metabolic energy is required when a person walks. In fact, when we go back to our space of biomimicity, uh, versus metabolic cost of transport. The blue, the blue are various uh, stable solutions of the model, and the best solution is one that's within the human cost of transport and has the highest R value. So what does such a model teach us about how to design uh, robots that attach to people? So for a few years, my group has been focused on uh, rebuilding people, building knees and ankles and hip. Now I'm gonna talk about our ankle work. Uh, so this ankle is, has various springs, it has a motor and a transmission, uh, three microprocessors, an onboard battery. Uh, so what's actuated here is the ankle joint, the subtalar joint is elastically passive. So in testing this device clinically, uh, we, we find uh, very nice emulation with the biological body, in plot A, the blue symbols are the bionic device. The shaded region is mean plus or minus standard deviation of a biological legged walker uh, versus walking speed. So you see we predict the ankle angle at toe off well. Plot B is total ankle work, mechanical work normalized by total body mass in kilograms versus speed. You see the device is actually doing excessive work at low walking speeds. We've since fixed that, it's a bug. And C just shows the faster the person walks, the greater is the work or the mechanical energy output. So because of these uh, normalized mechanics, uh, we, we were able to affect the energetics of amputee walkers as well as their walking speed. In plot A, the red curve is what uh, conventional technology can provide, and the blue curve is the bionic device, and the green data are from an age, weight, height match person with biological limbs. And there's no significant difference between the bionic leg and the biological leg. Plot B shows normalization of walking speed. So what is our approach? 
So the ankle has um, a motor and a transmission and a tendon-like series spring. And in parallel with that is a, is a unidirectional spring. So when the ankle's at 90 degrees, that, that parallel spring stores energy and releases, but beyond 90 degrees, it's not engaged. So the upper plot, it shows you what we have to do in torque and angle space. And if you plot, if you then subtract away the parallel spring, it's what the series elastic actuator has to do to achieve the emulation. So this, the parallel elasticity uh, increases force bandwidth. The series spring uh, increases motor efficiency and power uh, amplification. So here are data from a, a, an actual ankle uh, worn by an amputee. Plotted vertically is ankle mechanical power in watts. The blue data are the power output of the joint, and the red is from the motor. So we get a very, very large power amplification from about 300 watts peak power on the motor side to about 700 watts on the output side. So this is a catapult. The tendon-like spring is wound up by the motor, and then it's, it's all dumped at very, very high powers. That's how your, your soleus, your calf muscles attach to your Achilles tendon work. What about control? So here's a two-state machine, a swing and a stance phase. In the swing phase, we reposition the ankle. We do a position control so that the person doesn't trip, and we orient the position of the device for foot strike. When the foot's in contact with the ground or stance, we do a biophysical model-based control. So here's, here's the controller. On the right-hand side, you see the prosthesis or the plant. We measure position and speed of the joint. That's fed into a neuromuscular model, the block on the far left. And then that neuromuscular model tells us what the torques and impedances would, of the joint would be if the joint were controlled with muscles and tendons and spinal reflexes. The rest of it is just a torque control uh, by the robot. So here's the neuromuscular model. So we have a, for those biophysicists in the audience, we use a hill-type muscle model. And uh, we input the length of the muscle tendon complex and the speed of the muscle tendon complex. We then have a spinal reflex feeding back force, velocity, and position. The dominant, again, is force feedback, as we know from the biophysical data. The greater the force, the greater the activation, and then that tells us the torque. So why, why do all this modeling? Why ca carefully model the human? Why not just do, you know, a classic meat and potatoes robotic control, say high impedance position control? And we'll out, you know, we'll inject trajectories that we think are appropriate. There's, there's emerging evidence that a controller that's based on a biophysical model has fantastic emergent properties. So for this particular example, one emergent property is that the device automatically adapts for speed. So these data show, the upper plot shows an amputee walking on a level surface, and the network is five joules output from the ankle during stance. The middle plot shows the amputee walking up a hill. The network is 12 joules. And the lower plot shows the amputee walking down a hill. And the network is zero joules. The robot has no idea what the Earth looks like. It has no idea that the ground is changing inclinations. So what happens is, uh, with this force feedback, you go up the hill. That applies greater forces on the virtual muscles. And the force feedback gives you more work and power. When you go downhill, uh, the loop reverses. Uh, and if the hill's steep enough, uh, the hysteresis reverses and the, the machine takes energy out for the person. So if we had to detect every single inclination of the ground, we would be in trouble. That's not how the human body works. I can blindfold all of you, get you hopelessly drunk, which I'm sure you've all been during this meeting, and take you outside, and as long as the ground doesn't change dramatically, you'll do fine. Um, so we're, we're very much, uh, in terms of walking, spinal animals. So there's also emergent behavior and speed. With this device, the faster you walk, the greater is the power, the greater is the work. So uh, those of you who know me, in, in 1982, I was in a mountain climbing accident, and I, I now use two prostheses. So I'm wearing, wearing these robots. So when I walk slowly, you can't, you're not able to hear anything um, unless you're sitting right in the front row. Um, uh, that's 
And the reason is the ankle's doing is spring-like. The motor isn't doing network. But as I walk faster and faster, you start to hear the device. And if I go really fast, that's two lines of code. <laughs> So I would say if you take the smartest human being in the world and she took every control course in the world, she would not think of that. We didn't think of that. We stole it from nature. So here is a uh, US soldier. He was uh, hit by a blast, lost a leg. He was fitted with this bionic device an hour before this video was taken. He was taken outside. He just decided to run. We didn't ask him to run. He was inspired to run. So two, two points. One is we didn't model running. We modeled walking. But it turns out these fundamentals are also appropriate for running. So we got that for free. Wouldn't happen with position control. Secondly, there's no, there's no manual here. There's no training course. Because, we've, because the device reflects biological dynamics, the human body is, is used to those dynamics. So there's no training. We often fit people in minutes. So the next extreme interface is uh, electrical. So obviously when a limb is amputated, key nerves are transected, they're amputated. And how can we develop electronics to communicate with a transected nerve? So one thing we're exploring at MIT, uh, this is directed by research scientist Ron Rizzo, is can we put uh, in the vicinity of a transected nerve uh, skin cells and muscle cells. What happens then is the nerve sprouts, regenerate, attaches to those end organs. The body of the human or the animal quickly vascularizes those tissues and you end up with a completely stable implant. What we'll do then is take motor signals from the muscle sliver, because muscle natu is a natural amplifier of the nerve signal. And what we want to do eventually is stimulate through the cutaneous axons that attach to the skin cells to have a feedback, so take sensory information from the robot and reflect it onto the nervous system. The dream is that one day people will be able to feel uh, as they walk across sand. So there's, a, there's evidence a mile high that if you put a muscle, a denervated muscle, a muscle that doesn't have a nerve, next to a nerve, time and time again, the nerve sprouts, grows, and attaches to the muscle. It's very, very repeatable, and that's what we're doing here. So here in the upper left, you see a, a diagram of the transected nerve and the skin and muscle cells. To the right, you see histology showing the vascularization of those tissues. Uh, we've done these experiments and verified the sprouting and the robustness um, uh, beyond a year. So what we envision is one day, uh, if a nerve has been transected, perhaps we'll take skin cells and muscle cells from the human, we'll grow skin patches, we'll grow muscle slivers, we'll put those cells in some type of scaffold with embedded electrodes, the nerve will sprout, segregate into motor and sensory ports, and we'll have a viable uh, implant. So another thing that has to be done in terms of the extreme interface electrical is to measure the electromyographic signal. When, when the muscle fires, that's caused by an electrical pulse, can we measure that electrical pulse? So there's folks around the world developing implants to do just that. This, this is a, an implantable myelectric sensor um, that's just now emerging in the research world to measure that EMG signal. So how, if we had these neural implants, how would we, what would we do with the signals? So back to this, uh, this controller with spinal modeled muscles and spinal reflexes. Uh, what we're envisioning is that the intrinsic controller, the synthetic microprocessor uh, modulated uh, device is implementing these spinal, these rapid spinal reflexes. And then the slow, low information content neural command we use to modulate the gain, the sensitivity of those reflexes. So we've done initial experiments and it's fantastic. 
So here's data of peak power versus walking speed. So we've shown that with uh, a measurement of cast muscle modulating the sensitivity of the positive force feedback reflex, that a person is able to have full controllability over the bionic device, as well as a purely intrinsic control. So you're saying, so what? If you can do it intrinsically, if the robot itself can do it, why use the neural command? And the answer is, as an amputee, speaking personally, um, it's, it's frustrating to always be in the back seat of the car. And I, was, I took part in these experiments, um, and it was cool. Like, I was standing talking to someone, and then I wanted to walk off quickly, and I fired my calf muscle, and I bounced away. I got to steps, and I fired my muscles, and I went up the steps. I got to the top, I went down, and I relaxed my calf muscles so I wouldn't get energy. And I was like, wow, I'm finally driving the car. This is wonderful. We also use the EMG command uh, for a positional reflex. So this controller just takes the electromyographic signal from the muscle and switches be, uh, as a person transitions from gait terrain to gait terrain. So for example, from level ground to steps, from level ground going down steps, and so on and so forth. The person can fire their muscles and output these kinematic patterns. So here the amputee sees the steps, they fire their muscles, and that's sent to the, to the robot, telling the robot to point its toes. When the robot's in contact with the ground, it's intrinsic. When it's off the ground, it's extrinsic with the neural command. So extreme interface, I'll finish up with mechanical interface. So if, if you ask, if you ask a thousand people that use prostheses and braces, what's the number one problem you want fixed? Probably all thousand say, the damn thing hurts. Okay, you need to fix that. Um, so I've, this is where I began in design and, and we're now, my lab is now pursuing this with vengeance. Um, so one thing we're, you know, the way, the way my sockets are, are built today or fabricated is I'm wrapped in a gauze that's impregnated with plaster. And as it's hardening, the prosthetist pinches my residual limb. I mean, it, that's how crude it is. It's, it's uh, you know, 100-year-old craft techniques. So clearly what we need to do is ad increase the volume of data that we extract from the human, develop models of the human, and then in a purely quantitative, non-craft technique uh, output an optimal interface. So what we've done is, uh, one thing we've done is develop a methodology to map the skin strain field. So as I'm walking here and moving my joints, there's an elaborate strain field. My skin is being stretched in very interesting ways. We need to do that because the interface is completely intimate with the body and that the interface directly adjacent to the skin needs to move like the skin. We also need rich data on how stiff people are and their shape under different loads. So we're taking MRI data, which tells us the various tissues and their densities. We're developing models that, that uh, estimate how stiff a body is on, upon orthogonal displacement, its stiffness and dampening. So what you see in the right is uh, the green areas is where the, the residual limb is very, very stiff. The red areas is where it's very, very soft. This is a below knee amputation. So then we're mapping that body stiffness to the interface design. So where the body is stiff, we make the interface soft. Where the body is soft, we make the inter interface uh, uh, stiff. So what we're doing is 3D printing these interfaces. So every color here is a different durometer, a different viscoelastic property. So the green there, it's a very, very soft where the tibial plateau is, and it gets stiffer uh, as the colors change. The black is the most stiff. If you just 3D print this and do this linear mapping between body stiffness and interface stiffness, when you stand in it, it would just collapse. So what those black tentacles are are for structure. They're connecting black regions so it doesn't collapse under a person's weight. So we've already taken pressure data, pressure sensors within the residual limb. We've shown 20% reductions in pressure. So what, that's a spatially varying impedance interface. What about temporally changing interface? I want to, in the future, walk over that chair, sit down, have the interface be smart enough to know that I'm sitting down and just relax because I don't want the high pressures on me when I sit down. So this material I'm about to show you is electrostatic materials developed by 
Roy Kornblow and colleagues at SRI International in California. Voltage off. Voltage on. So we'll have windows, you know, where the body's really soft and the interface is stiff. We're going to make it out of this stuff. So it just relaxes as soon as you don't need, as soon as it's not load bearing. So on being bionic, we're starting to see devices that with a straight face you can call bionic. Again, the definition of bionic is you have to at least emulate, okay? People typically think of bionic as extending, as augmenting. But bionic can also mean the emulation of physiological um, capacity. So we're, we're beginning to say, see devices that emulate. And it's extraordinary the effect on the human. When, when fitted with such a technology, often the user doesn't view it as a tool, like a hammer is a tool, like a lifeless device. They view it as part of their body. And they say things like, I feel complete whole again. So I'd like to tell you three stories, uh, clinical stories of folks that have been fitted with the device that I'm wearing. Uh, the first story is regarding Ed Stowski. Ed was in a motorcycle accident and he, he was experienced about 40 surgeries. And uh, this is his story. Uh, he said, uh, when being fitted, uh, having the bionic leg has given me back my life, I feel whole again. My name is Ed Westowski. 1967, I joined the Army, and I was medically retired in 1984 after having a motorcycle accident on the 7th of August, 1981, where I took off most of my thigh, broke my femur, severed the artery in my right arm. I had 39 operations between all the hospitals, and West Roxbury was the last one, and that was number 40, and that was the amputation. The ability to go up and down a hill without feeling a pain in my hip or back or the knee, uh, cut back on my meds by a third. I feel more like a human being, uh, complete, whereas you know, I can watch people in the eye as I walk down a street instead of watching the ground or where I'm stepping. It's, you know, being a normal person again. It's fantastic. You can't beat it. So our thesis is when you're able to emulate a body part and you, you, you do that technologically, um, what you in fact achieve is not, not only a profound increase in quality of life, but also a decrease in health care costs across the lifetime of the patient. You heard him say, my hip and back doesn't hurt. I've cut my pain mints by one third. You know, this, the governments uh, are, are spending millions and millions of dollars on all these reconstruction surgeries, the pain meds, people going, being out of work. If we have good technology, if we have bionics, we can, we can solve the quality of life issue and simultaneously solve the uh, health care cost uh, crisis. Uh, so the next study is uh, Eric Hurlbert. Um, Eric was hit by a motor, uh, he was on a motorcycle, was hit by a car, and this is his story. I have painkillers right now to help me. It doesn't take it away, but it lowers it down to I can tolerate it. We were fortunate enough to walk him on a passive device. And then on a powered device. And without question, his functional performance was through the roof with the powered device. So that's why we recommend going in that direction. Any pain? Finally, Stefan Hendrick. Stefan's from Mississippi. He's a Medicare-aged uh, individual. And 
Here was his emotional response. These are chairs that Joe are. How was that? Great. Good. I haven't wanted to move my ankle in 14 years. This is not tool use, this is embodiment. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you'd like to come over and have a seat. So we have a, we have a collection here of uh, questions from a variety of the audience. Um, the one I put on top is for those of us that are techies. Um, how much battery capacity, how much power, recharging? Uh, I knew it. <laughs> I mean, how do you make the thing work? Okay, so, so one note. So it's critical in, in such design to have a default, so I, I take the batteries out and I'm still able to walk safely. So what we do is we, uh, we detect low voltage and we short the motor leads. Uh, so now energy is coming out the motor, it's behaving like a, uh, a damper. So when I put the batteries in, note that they're modular like a power tool. So it, it beeps because it just boot up. I think, I think it booted there. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so we, we're about 40% efficient um, and we're able to do three, three to 4,000 fast walking steps. Uh, so a, you know, in my lifestyle, I'm fairly sedentary, I'm a professor. Um, so I can nearly get through a day, uh, but people that walk 10,000 steps a day uh, would just take a spare battery or two. Um, there's, there's very compelling motor platforms coming down the road, and we're al always being teased as technologists that there's a, we're about to see a great battery. Um, so, but I, I'm, <laughs> I'm confident uh, things, will, things will improve. No one, it's rare when a person complains about uh, battery life, it's very rare. Um, it's not that it's, they'd, they of course would rather uh, be able to walk farther on a, on a charge, uh, but they're getting so much benefit that they don't mind charging batteries at night and taking a spare with them. So when, you, when, the, when the battery's engaged, what's the, what's the difference in what you can do, not do? I didn't quite get that from. So when I take the batteries out, the motor, uh, we short the motor leads. So it's a passive device, and um, it's the ankle becomes a damper. So you can only move the joint passively, and it's like a hydraulic damper is spanning the ankle joint. So it's safe, but the moment I pop this out, if, if, if you do the following experiment, I'm walking, and you suddenly cut the power, uh, it feels like you've duct taped a, a very heavy brick to my foot. What the power does is it cancels the mass of the device. Uh, that the human body doesn't see the mass of the device. Your, your leg, assuming you have biological legs, are very, very heavy. The density of tissues is about the density of water. So you can look at the volume of your leg and imagine how much that weighs. Your legs weigh a lot. They don't feel heavy because of your muscles. So as soon as the voltage is cut, I no longer have muscles and it feels like feels like you duct tape a, a block to my leg. But I can get home safely. Um, how do you think brain-computer interfaces would impact human-computer interaction? Uh, it certainly make it more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and maybe we'll have fewer injuries due to keyboards and mouse. Uh, um, <laughs> and hopefully we can kind of stream of consciousness have this interface with between our brains and machines. Um, will we go there? Um, I think we will. I think what will happen is neural implants will be made safe uh, for extreme users. I call myself an extreme user of technology because without technology, um, there's a 
tremendous uh, difference in my life. Without these legs, I can only crawl. With the legs, I can do whatever I want to do. So I, I'm completely reliant on technology. And a person like me is therefore willing to take the medical risks. I'm willing to have implants that are not yet uh, figured out, uh, put into my body as a, as a guinea pig. Um, so there'll be a time when these neural implants have been researched so comprehensively that they'll be safe. And then what I think in, there'll be some wacky artists that say, I want to do that. I want to think and turn on a device. I want to jump around with these exoskeletal bionic limbs. And uh, they'll do it. And I think it'll spread like fire wildfire. Thank you. So I've, I've got a whole collection of questions here, which all come down to um, can we or should we build the $6 million man? That's the summary of a whole stack of, uh, and, the, and it comes in sort of two parts. Should we create prostheses that are actually superhuman? And the other one is, is what does it cost to do such a thing like this? So you can build a $6 million man or woman uh, if you have $6 million. <laughs> you, can, you can waste that money and do all kinds of things. In fact, I'm about, I'm about a $100,000 man. Okay. Um, but I understand your question. Um, I, I, the, the other question I didn't give you is, will you end up looking like Lee Majors when you're done? But I left that one That's out. very insulting. <laughs> Please. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been heavily involved with the Oscar Pistorius case. He's that South African fellow that was born without fibula bones when he was, I think, 11 months old. Doctors amputated his legs. Now he uses these spring, uh, carbon spring structures called cheetahs, and he's extraordinarily fast. His athletic event is the 400 meter. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's a hair width away from qualifying for the London Olympics. If you'll recall, he was, uh, he was banned from the Beijing Olympics, and it was appealed to a higher court. I was an expert witness along with my colleague, Roger Cram, and we, uh, we got it overturned. Um, so now if he qualifies, he can in fact uh, compete. So uh, there's a lot of rational people out there that, that believe that he should be banned, that in fact those carbon springs are augmenting his physicality. Uh, there's not yet evidence to support that hypothesis. Um, but they do, the spring devices do remarkably well in emulating the biological leg. Uh, will we in 20 years have a prosthesis that allows a person to run faster than is natural? I think so. Um, can we do that today? No, we can't. So we're, we're knocking in the doors of, of Lee Majors, but we're not quite there. Is there something you don't often have the chance to talk about or that you wish people would ask you about concerning research or otherwise? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm asked a lot of things. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, depending on the audience, you know, I, I gave a talk at a, in, where, where the audience comprised uh, historians, and they just attacked me. They just, they compared me to Oppenheimer. They said I was, you know, destroying the future of humanity. And I was like, wow. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, the, the ethical question, every technology, as we all know, there's, there's ways to use the technology that benefit humanity and there's ways to use the technology uh, that, that harm uh, people. And one has to do the calculus, uh, you know, weight the good and the bad. Um, it's, it's a fact that, that over half the US population, by extension the world population, has some form of cognitive, emotional, or physical condition. And because of poor technology, most of the people are severely disabled. So in this 21st century, we have a remarkable opportunity, a moral opportunity, to advance, to fundamentally change the human-machine interaction, and to change those disabilities into only conditions. Like a person that's seeing impaired that wears glasses has the condition of being seeing impaired. But because of the prosthetic called an eyeglass, they're not, they're not, that condition is not disabling. 
fact, eyeglasses are now a fashion statement. With me, I have the condition that my limbs happen to be amputated, but it's not a disability. I climb mountains, I jog, I do what I want to do because of this interplay between my body and technology. So we have an extraordinary narrative to say between humans and machines that's so important. Yes, there'll be nefarious means of using these technologies, but my God, we need to do it. We, we have an opportunity to eliminate disability in this country. So I have one here. The, the question is, can technology like this help people who are not amputees but are suffering limited mobility, such as arthritis or other you know, jo degenerative joints of various kinds? Yeah, the answer is yes. So uh, I didn't talk about our, our other work, but we're, we're building robots that wrap around uh, limbs. Um, in the case of a, an impaired limb, it's, it's an orthotic device where the interaction between the, dis the leg with pathology and the robot uh, the goal is to have that interaction result in normal dynamics. Uh, and then, a part of my lab, we build exoskeletal structure, robots that wrap around the limb, a, a quote-unquote normal limb, and the goal is to extend normal physiological function, so allow people to jump higher, run faster, run with less metabolic energy, less stress through their joints. So absolutely, everything that I talked about here has very broad application. I think the one thing that stood out for me the most um, during your talk was um, the gentleman who has aspired to run after only having won the, the prosthetic for a short period of time. Can you speak a little bit more about experiences that you've had like that with uh, people you've provided these devices to? Yeah, the, the emotional response when we fit a person, um, just, just let me comment to give you a sense of the differential. Conventional technology, speaking specifically to this device, are comprised of springs. When the foot's in contact with the ground, they just store energy and release energy. Okay? Because of thermodynamics, you get less energy out than is stored. Right? Um, this device, we're outputting a factor of two higher mechanical work, an eight-fold power. So this, when someone puts this on, it's like, woo! <laughs> it's not like, I think I feel it. It's like, oh my gosh. So about half the people start crying, as you saw in the videos, and the other half start giggling. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. That's a, that's a great response. That, that's a win when you get that. So uh, several people have asked, do you still climb? Yeah, when, uh, when I have time, which is not, <laughs> not, a, not a whole lot. Um, yeah, I, I climb competitively before my limbs are amputated at the age of 17. I was, I was considered a child prodigy and was climbing the hardest routes in the United States. And then afterwards, um, I wasn't happy with the limbs that were given to me. They were designed for very slow walking on a horizontal world. So I, I went to the machine shop and I started building limbs optimized for the vertical world of rock and ice climbing. And in about six months after my legs were amputated, I was climbing at the same level in 12 months, I was climbing at a more advanced level with artificial limbs. And that was just inspiring to me. That's how I got into technology. Before that, I was a, an F, B, maybe C student in high school. Uh, my goal is to be the best climber in the world. And after that, I was like, math is cool. Engineering is cool. <laughs> you know, look at the climbs I can do now. So as a closing question for us here, uh, which I think is one of the best that we have in this stack, which is, as a community of people who do human-computer interaction, uh, how can we help? Yeah, I, you could probably tell what I'm going to say. Um, um, so it's, it, it was believed for a very long time, and it's still believed by many people in the field, that we need better components. We need a synthetic actuator that behaves like living muscle tissue. We need a battery that's much, much better, uh, or a, a, you know, generally a fuel source. But what I hope I've convinced you in my talk is that you know, all that we did in my group is we more deeply understood how the body works. There's not, there's not a single component in these devices uh, that's really novel. 
we're using a brushless motor, we're using regular carbon springs, we're using a ball speed transmission, regular microprocessors, battery. We're pushing everything to their absolute limit, don't get me wrong. But it, the novelty is the architecture, and we stole that architecture from nature. So I think to really change the game of, of human computer interaction, human machine interaction, we need to, we need to nature driving design. We need to motivate design with a fundamental understanding of how our brains work and our bodies work. Then we'll get a seamless interaction. I am often very frustrated by technology. I often want to put my fist through the computer screen. The computer doesn't know my emotional state. The computer doesn't, knows very little about me. That's a problem. That's, that's the future, a very critical narrative in design. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you.